All right, I'm seeing the participants are being let in. Good morning, everybody. Let's let the uh, participants uh, join the call. Give it a couple of minutes. It's giving everybody an opportunity to join. All right, I, I think, well, let's see. I think we still got number. I see the number still coming in. I'll give it a I'll give it another minute or two. All right, Sean, it's 10.02, so why don't we get started? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Ed Alcock. Um, for those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm an attorney, a condominium law attorney with the law firm of Alcock and Marcus. And with me is Sean Jordan. Sean? Thanks, Ed. Um, my name is Sean Jordan. I'm the director of property management with First Service Residential. Um, you know, I am. I've had a, a number of hats over the years, but my primary um, is, history has been in portfolio and property management as a site manager, portfolio manager, and then overseeing other uh, managers uh, across our team for the last twenty some odd years. So, thank you for having me to join you. So, so today we're going to be talking about safety and security in condominiums. Um, and, and it's based on a decision from a Massachusetts Superior Court that issued on July 5th of 2022 involving um, a double murder at a South Boston condominium and in, in involving uh, liability issues by or on behalf of the board, the management company, and a concierge company in connection with that. Now, uh, our program kind of came together because I saw Sean at an event in August, and I had always noticed that Sean, who is on my um, Facebook, uh, drives around uh, the state and uh, actually physically visits his condominiums, which I tend to think is a good practice for a property manager. And he would, you know, make social media accounts of that. Uh, so when we were at this event in August, uh, I had known about this case that came down. I was impressed by, by Sean's practice of looking at the property. And, and you'll see when we get into this case uh, that it talks a lot about the, the characteristics of the property and what the managers notice and so forth. Um, and then after we decided to put this program on, uh, a second incident occurred. Um, many of you may have heard about it. It's It was a uh, a tragic shooting of a property manager down in Georgia. Uh, so we decided to sort of blend and fold that incident into the uh, program as well. So um, so let's get started. Uh, and, and by the way, the program is being recorded. Um, and if anybody wants a copy of that uh, recording or the PowerPoint, you can simply ask us for it uh, at the end. You'll have our email information and so forth. So. Um, we're going to start with South Boston. Um, and, and what I want to do is I want to go through the facts of the case before we get into the law and, and, and the issues, um, uh, following that. So, so first I want to start with the building. So 
Many of you may know this building in South Boston. Uh, uh, Doctors Field and Bolanus lived in an 11 story, 144 uh, luxury unit in South Boston. Uh, like most condos, they had a property manager, um, there was a board uh, and a, a concierge. The doctor purchased the penthouse in 2013, penthouse A, for almost $2 million. Um, had a three-level garage that was accessed by a personally programmed transponder for security purposes. Uh, the building, like many uh, high-rises, uh, required a fob to gain entrance. The concierge desk had a computer. There were 14 uh, closed-circuit television cameras, which the concierge viewed. Um, the building had a service elevator in the garage that required a fob to get to floors one through 10. The penthouse floor required its own fob. However, uh, once on that service elevator, individuals could access any residential floor, uh, including the 11th floor um, where the penthouse was via two internal unlock stairwells and, that, and and you'll see that that's kind of important. So that's what the building was like. And many people may recognize that building in the photo. You can actually see it if you're driving into Boston uh, to the right um, of, of the expressway. So now we're gonna flip from that situation to Georgia. And um, Sean's gonna take that. Sean's gonna tell us what happened in Georgia. Thanks, Ed. Uh, so, so as Ed had said, you know, as we had started our, our conversations recently, uh, this tragic event had happened. And uh, back in August 22nd, 2022, a resident at a high rise condominium down in Atlanta uh, ended up shooting and killing their on site property manager, uh, wounding their chief engineer, and then going even further, uh, leaving that building and going to another building and uh, killing their association accountant. Um, as a, there's a lot of information that's still kind of coming out on this. So as I was doing a little bit of research, um, you know, as this slide has said, it was a long standing dispute between the, the condo and uh, this homeowner. Uh, but the primary driver from what it looks like was uh, this individual who um, had an accounting background, did not agree with their CPA uh, audit and had raised what she had said was a significant de uh, deficiency and it was disregarded in her opinion. Uh, and there, from there it progressed. Um, and I think that's something that um, as we get further along uh, in the in our conversations, you know, many managers or other other people in our industry have run into these type of situations where we've got someone who's got a background in a specific discipline, but don't practice that specific discipline. Um, so therefore they, they question things a little bit further and Unfortunately, with this one, this this individual, uh, her primary job was an IT role, so she wasn't even practicing accounting. So I can understand where you know something may have been under you know, may have been read one way, um, but uh, I think that's something we have to keep in mind as we continue to talk about this. Well, and it's funny, Sean. It, it's you know we all do run into the you know sometimes what I will call like like the jailhouse lawyers or the or the accountants or the people that think they know better. And sometimes they do yep. um, than what's going on at the association or what the association's professionals are doing. But we also, I think more and more keep running into people um, in the associations with, with issues. Um, uh, clearly, uh, Ms. Kegney was not, um, uh, not right. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it was mental illness or whatever. Um, actually, it, it's it's interesting because I know the lawyers in Georgia that were defending the 300 page uh, pro se federal court complaint that she had filed um, over these accounting issues, which then caused her to shoot people in the building and the accountant. Um, and as the active shooter situation was progressing, they were actually concerned uh, and the police were concerned because, or I think it was the FBI or, or um, uh, ATF that was following the situation. They were actually in communication with a cab driver at one point 
uh, they were concerned that she was driving to the lawyer's office. Oh. Um, and, and interestingly, I, I believe she went to somebody's home. So after she, after she killed the, the two people, the, the on-site manager and, and shot the chief engineer, um, she then drove to the accounting firm, somehow got access, shot the accountant and killed him, and then drove to somebody's house. Uh, I'm not sure whose house that was. It's not clear from the reports at this point in time, whether it was one of the lawyers uh, or whether, uh, another person from the accounting or management. Um, and she did it via taxi cab. Uh, so it's it's pretty amazing that uh, that this situation occurred um, and, and, you know, alarming as well. Uh, but let's, let's get back and we're going to shift back and forth. Let's get back to South Boston. So, so you, you have the layout of the property. Um, on May 5th of 2017, uh, those uh, doctors, doctors field um, and, and, Leonos are murdered in their unit at around 7 p.m. on May 5th of 2017 by a gentleman named Bompamum Taxira, who was a former disgruntled employee of the former concierge company that serviced the building. Um, the facts from the police report in the court case are that Taxira walked past the lobby at 2.40 p.m. At 3.50 p.m., he entered the garage uh, simply by following a vehicle that was being pulled into the garage by one of the concierge staff. Uh, the court case dictates that the concierge staff did not see Mr. Texera on the closed circuit television. Uh, one of the concierges was waving to somebody else as he, I guess he got out of the car. The other one who was supposed to be monitoring the closed circuit television uh, was looking at his cell phone. Uh, I don't know if he was looking at, uh, well, I don't know if he was looking at TikTok videos back in 2017, because I don't think they existed. Um, once in the garage, Texera waited for the elevator to be summoned, entered it, exited any floor via the stairwell, walked up to the 11th floor uh, and then apparently attacked one of the doctors as they were entering the unit, forced his way into the unit um, and once inside killed both of them. It's unclear whether, because uh, the doctors came in at different times. I think one showed up at 4.30, the other one showed up at five. So it's unclear whether he got in first or got in second. Um, uh, at or around the same time 911 calls were placed. So 911 calls start being placed by one of the doctors starting around like 7, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, and they kept doing it like at 7, 7.05, 7.15. They were very faint. Obviously, they were uh, in a state of distress at that point. But interestingly, at or around the same time, the concierge conducts a building tour, his, you know, does his rounds, starting on the penthouse floor. And he notices nothing amiss, nothing out of the ordinary. Obviously, the murders were, were undertaken or committed in the unit, but, but the rounds wind up being important. Um, less than an hour after the murders, or I guess maybe around 8.30, um, the uh, police dis, uh, discover the assailant in the unit, along with the two dead um, doctors. Interestingly, when the police go to the unit, they saw packages and keys strewn in the area in front of the unit, which is actually how they wind up gaining access to the unit. Um, so right now you've, you've heard about two situations and I'll let Sean take this over. Uh, one where there was a murder and a shooting in a building by a unit owner, and one where there was a double murder um, by a third party. 
different scenarios, but I think some of them raise the same questions. Sean? Right. So, uh, you know, as Ed and I had talked about this prior, um, two different situations, but more of an underlining, I guess, theme and concern that has helped prompt this today, which is access control and security. And so, you know, we've got six points here that, that you know, kind of came up in the conversations and we'll, we'll touch upon them. And again, as we get into question and answer, we'll, um, you know, we'll, we could probably elaborate a little bit more. So one of the, one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, the, I guess the configurations of the, of the buildings and, and the, the ambiance or the or projection of how you're trying to project your, your community. And then from there, you've also got the management uh, and other uh, ancillary uh, companies that might be associated in their access controls. So, so let, let me start, Sean, because I'm yep. going to ask you some point blank questions yep. here because you're, you're the property manager. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, obviously the, the accountant, let, let's talk about the accountant. The accountant was shot in his office offsite. They drove there and, um, and obviously gained access. What are people doing? now in terms of access to their offices you know whether you're a lawyer mm -hmm. whether you're a property manager whether you're an accountant um what do you guys do sean i mean i mean do you guys that does does an owner have the ability to like walk into your into your office at a reception desk and ask for you they do. And, and keep in mind, um, that's been a, a standard practice, I think, with a lot of our industries, because we're a people business, right? We, we want to we wanna be able to be open during business hours. Obviously, that was amended during COVID. Um, people could not just walk off the street at that point. You had to make an appointment. So we're, we're in a middle ground now where, where we do ask people to make appointments before they, they come over. Uh, but if someone does show up and they, they ring the doorbell, um, you know, we, we have a, a closed door now where we, we you know, have a, a camera and we can say, you know, you know where, do you have an appointment? Who are you here to see? What can we help you with? And then from there, um, once we can identify who they are, um, you know, they can wait in the reception area and the person will come out and meet them at the front. Because I, I, I'm hearing since then, and by the way, I'd love anybody that wants to put in an example of what their company or their association or their service provider does in terms of access control uh, to prevent these types of situations, type it in the chat um, and we can talk about it. Uh, I, I'm hearing about some law firms uh, across the country uh, that are using like a buzz in entry feature, mm -hmm. um, bulletproof glass, um, you know, almost like a, like a bank. Yep. Uh, you know, at, at the reception area, I, I'm curious to hear what other people, um, what other people are doing, but mm -hmm. to me, to me, the issue of, you know, what do I do in my office? What do you do in your office? Um, I think that's a little easier to me. The hard one here is what do you envision the future looking like? Uh, if you envision it changing at all for the on-site folks, you know, especially like an on-site person, well, it, could be, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily need to be a high-rise. Yep. It could be on-site in a high-rise, uh, in a gated community where a lot of owners just have, you know, sort of unfettered access to walk into their office or, or, or just walk up to the lobby desk where somebody right. is, you know, you know, kind of like at a hotel. I mean, do you envision that changing at all? I, I think they do. And, and, and we, you know, we do have our best practices that we try to um, keep, keep across the board with communities that do partner up with us. And then also we talk about these type of things uh, on, on webinars like this or at seminars at events or, or CAI articles and IRAM articles. Um, the, you know, again, as we talk about the different classifications, right, you've got front desk staff, they're out of the open. And so, you know, when we're working with developers or we're working with boards, you know, this question has come up and I'm sure it will come up again. You know, should we put plexiglass or should we put bulletproof glass up there? And it ends up looking like um, a bank teller, right? And if that's not the projection of what the community is looking for, because uh, I've, I've seen that happen where, where they've had those conversations and like, it doesn't feel inviting. This is, this is our home. We want people to feel 
Um, uh, uh, and it says that it looks like the chat is disabled. Uh, folks, I think that might be the, the messages are coming through private. So um, continue to put those, those um, messages in and we'll, we'll, um, we'll answer them as they're coming through. Uh, let's see, it wouldn't let me type. Um, and if you want to take a look at that, I'll keep talking. Yeah, I'll take a look at the chat. So, you know, with regards to front desk staff and just is with the management, you know, part of our job is to make sure our, our on-site team is safe. That's first and foremost. You know, uh, what, you know it's one of those things that, um, you know, is is absolutely one of the first things that we, we want to make sure happens. So, again, to, to kind of work around a little bit for, for front desk staff or those locations, you know, there's there's places where, you know, you've got a vestibule. So if someone who's a resident, they come in one entryway, guests come another way. Um, people that are coming in to be announced, sometimes uh, depending on the building practice, they need to stay outside that vestibule until they've been identified and called up to the homeowner to say, you know, uh, you know, Mr. Jordan, Ed's here, do you want to see him today? No, send that guy away. I don't want to talk to him. But, uh, you know, but the the reality of it is, is, um, you know, sometimes, um, you know, when, when you're having a conversation with the homeowner on a one on one, um, you know, where a manager is involved it might be a more sensitive uh, conversation. If you do have to have those conversations, try and do it in an area that's open, you know, someplace where they can't, other people can't hear the conversation, but at least you're not behind a closed door. Or if you do have an office that has the front windows on them, uh, make sure that, you know, it's visible, that the blinds aren't closed when you're having a conversation with someone from, from um, any visitor that's coming into your office. And again, it, it's to help give you a bit of peace of mind as well as uh, let them know, you know, besides the cameras that might be in this vestibule, there's also, you know, people can see through this window. And so I, I, uh, I, I don't know what's going on with the chat. I mean, I, I was able to type something in, but maybe it's just for panelists. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, put them uh, under the Q&A, uh, the Q&A space. I, I got a couple already. Yep. Uh, one, somebody asked about safety in condos that are townhouses. I don't think this is any different. I mean, I mean, uh, the, the panoply of uh, events that could occur, you know, the, the South Boston one and the Georgia one happened in high rises, but you can have uh, a shooting in a gated community, whether it's, uh, I mean, not, not, that I, not that I'm advocating that, but uh, it, it could happen anywhere. And, and I think we want to talk about security measures, you know, maybe for the, quite frankly, the on-site person might be more exposed in a townhome uh, community than they are in a um, in a high rise. And then somebody else said, you know, you can always have security measures, but it doesn't mean anything if people prop doors open, buzz anyone in, piggyback on garage doors. And I think they're right. And, you know, um, one, one question I have for you, uh, Sean, before we move to the next slide, yep. is do you guys like utilize, um, I, mean, I mean, we've got here safety and security protocols. Mm -hmm. um, obviously you're a management company. From time to time, do you hire, do some of your properties hire actual security companies or do you consult with security experts to kind of figure out where the, um, you know, uh, possible uh, weak points in access control can be? Yes, to both of those uh, questions. Um, we, we do have security uh, at some properties um, in, and they work in tandem with the front desk staff. Um, you know, so they're out walking the perimeter because, uh, you know, that this particular community or these communities are open uh, that have public public ways. So they're, they're by the waterfront or they're, they're by, by the common or there's some other place uh, where there's going to be a lot more traffic than a normal um, community that's not a also a tourist destination, for example. Um, you find, do you find sometimes that owners confuse the concierge um, or sometimes even the on-site for security? Yes, that, that, is, that is definitely um, uh, something that, that we do want to expand upon. You know, concierge, they're, they're trained for meet and greets. Uh, they're there to facilitate package uh, deliveries, um, meet with, uh, you know, picking up dry cleaning and helping you with reservations. Security personnel are normally people that used to work in the public sector, either in the armed forces or in 
uh, as a for first responder, as a police officer or a sheriff. Um, and they're trained in, in, in body language and takedown methods. Those are two completely different classifications. Um, and I think it's important that when you're dealing with residents uh, as a community, that the board and the management company help reinforce the difference between those type of, of personnel. I would not expect a concierge to jump in front of someone to stop them uh, or try to take down someone. Um, you, you know, it's funny, uh, Bill Casper from Urban Management just typed in something on the Q&A and, &A and I, I think it's kind of interesting. And and what, what Bill typed in was that, you know, sometimes boards need to be more sensitive. Um, and, and in particular, Bill said on fines. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes fines, you know, uh, or insensitive boards can drive anger and frustration. And I assume I wouldn't just put boards there. I would say sometimes managers uh, and even attorneys or accountants, we can, you know, we can get frustrated and, and be insensitive. What, and, and I think it's a great point. Yep. Um, uh, and, and something to keep in mind with what's going on in the world today. What I always um, advocate when a board is going to issue a fine is for the board to actually hold a hearing, you know, not just send out a letter uh, to an owner, hey, you're fined $500 for this without an opportunity for due process and for the two parties to come face to face, uh, which sometimes I find winds up getting people to understand the other situation and, and maybe resolving it and avoiding situations. But I think a great point by Bill. All right, I, so I'm gonna, I, yeah, I'm gonna move jump, on I do, from- I was gonna say, I do agree with that as well, especially as the economy is starting to tighten now. Um, anyone who is getting frequent fines for something and they're not feeling like they're being heard, it, it's artificially, um, well, not artificially, it, it's, it's causing the situation to get bigger and bigger. And um, you know, it's something where if, if this is something where they do want to contest it, yes, have the conversation with those people. Don't let this drag on for a long period of time. So um, interestingly, I practice in the state of Rhode Island um, in addition to Mass in New Hampshire. Um, Rhode Island uh, actually requires a hearing um, before you issue a fine. Uh, and, and I think you know, it's called a due process hearing. You know, it's a little bit attenuated, but I think the point is that you know we can put up bulletproof glass we can lock the doors we can we can have buzz in entries camera surveillance do all of these things but i think bill casper's point is and and to a certain extent sean what you were saying is that sometimes it's the human element and 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 dealing with people that 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 is probably the one of the most effective safety and security protocols sometimes Absolutely. I, mean, I, I believe so. We're, we're in a people business, you know, it's a, we, while we're, while we're business professionals and we can have that disconnection for the business side of it, we're dealing with people's homes and there's an emotional attachment to that just as much as their kids or their pets. And so they, they are going to be more uh, animated and more vocal about certain things. And it's important to take the time to listen and, and figure out if you can find a common ground, especially between a board and a resident uh, where they may not necessarily be on the same side and you're, you're helping them become neighbors again by helping facilitate that conversation. All right. So, you know, we sort of talked already about all of the things that we can do or some of the things that we can do to make our property safer. We can hire a security expert. We can hire a security guard. We can put up cameras, monitor cameras. We can have garage transponders, fobs, um, we can uh, um, bulletproof glass, enclosures, all kinds of things uh, that an association and or its management company can do. Then that raises the question of do increased security measures then increase the risk of liability to the condos and their providers in the event that there is an incident? Sean? Um, take this slide, because uh, after the doctors were brutally murdered, you can imagine what happened next. Yep. Um, so, you, as, as this is saying here, uh, the the estates of the slain doctors ended up suing the management company, uh, the property manager, uh, the concierge company, and um, 
basically had made the assumption or the assertion that and the condo board and the condo board. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, uh, to to basically say that they 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 were parties or that there was a way they could have prevented this. And um, I think that's an important, important thing to note. Um, you know, as we are dealing with human elements, uh, the as we, as we become more and, and, and I talked about this as well. Remember, we're part of a community of a larger community. Right. We're, we're not police officers. The board are not police officers. And so, you know, if, they're, if you're in a high crime area and you're doing these things to help better secure the access to your communities and, and create more security, it doesn't substitute the fact that there are other resources that are out there out of our tax dollars that um, you also want to loop into this as well. Make sure they're doing their part, uh, which they are. You know, I'm not saying no one's not. But if you're having an issue in an area, um, you know, make sure that they're aware that, that you know, you're having a, a, a number of attempted break-ins in your building and ask for some more police presence to come around for a short period of time. We've, we've had to deal with that around certain pro properties that we have. Um, and, um, you know, by, by taking all these things on, um, it's definitely important to have the conversation, not only with your attorney, but also your insurance company about what your risk factors are and making sure that you're properly adjusted and, and not taking on more of your responsibility. Um, or less, um, just to make sure that you're you're understanding the current situation. So, okay. so here's what here's what's going on, and why you know I, I think this is interesting. So, so the estates sued, as Sean said, the condo board, the manager, and the concierge company for wrongful death, mm -hmm. even though the murder was committed by a third party. So, so the condo, the property manager, and the concierge company all filed motions to dismiss the case on the grounds that, hey, look, you know, we're not responsible for the independent actions of a third party. On July 5th, Judge Christine Roach of the Massachusetts Superior Court issued a 22 page decision denying the dismissal and saying, nope, all three of you might be liable and you're gonna have to stand trial on the negligence claims. Uh, the case is Field versus Highbridge. Let me know if you want a copy of it um, and I, you know, I can email it to you after we're done today, yep. but Ed, we got, a, we got a couple of questions that popped up on this. I think that are kind of, okay. Uh, unless it might tie into this. So let's, let's see if we, if, when we go through them, if we say, we'll, we'll hit them afterwards. Yeah. Um, maybe we can hit those after. Cause I think these kind of go back to, um, yeah, I, I think the, those questions are perfect. Okay. After I get through the decision a little bit. Okay. So, so, you know, what we're talking about here is, is, protecting the residents from actions of third parties, okay? So in the court decision, the court said, look, a duty of care can arise in three ways, existing social norms and customs. Um, now, what does that mean? Uh, the, the reality is social norms and customs are constantly evolving, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, let's just think of what condos did during the pandemic. Would condos be wiping down surfaces, shutting pools, shutting, um, uh, you know, uh, exercise rooms, things of that nature 15 years ago? I don't think so. Um, there's all, there, there've been a lot of changes in social norms and customs and it's something we have to remember when we go to court, that judges are people too. And while we all like to think the law is black and white, uh, the reality is, and I think you're going to see in this decision, it can be manipulated um, to uh, affect a result uh, that, that a particular judge might feel is right. Uh, the second way a duty can, can arise, and we're going to see in this case, is by voluntary assumption of the duty. Uh, and then the third way, which we're also going to see in this case, is you can assume the duty uh, by contract. Generally speaking, there is no duty of care that exists to protect others from criminal activities of third persons unless, unless it was reasonably foreseeable. So, you know, does the does the board, the condo uh, manager, the concierge have knowledge of a prior criminal activity or of opportunity? 
and we're going to see that as well um, a little bit in the uh, in the judge's decision. Um, so, you know, the the um, I always like to tell a condo board, uh, and and right now we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go through each each entity, the condo board, the property manager, and the concierge. Why were they found to be potential? Why weren't, why weren't they dismissed? And what can they do uh, as a result? And, and what do we need to think about going forward as a result of this case? I always tell condo boards that your primary duty is to maintain, repair, and replace common areas. That's it. Uh, uh, you know, there is there is no published Massachusetts appellate case stating whether that duty to maintain, repair and replace common areas extends to protect owners from actions of third parties carried out in the common areas. In fact, uh, there were two prior cases, one in 94, one in 2004, where uh, I think one was a rape case, one was an assault case. I think the, the rape of the assault case was somebody left their slider open and then sued the board. Uh, court said, you know, you, you had a known and open obvious danger. The second one was, I think, a condo on Beacon Hill where they have those basement units and somebody got into a basement window and the owner sued uh, and committed a rape. The owner sued the board and uh, claimed that the board should have put bars on the windows and, and the court dismissed that case. Now, in this decision, Judge Roach says, you know, I can't find any cases that are published cases. Those other two cases, they're not published. They're, they're not precedential. So I'm going to look at Arizona and California. And Arizona and California held that condos should be held to the same standard of care that a landlord is as it relates to common areas and therefore bears a duty of exercise of due care for a resident's safety in those areas under the condo's control. And that while not a guarantor of safety, the landlord's not free to ignore reasonably foreseeable risks of harm that could result from an unlawful intrusion. Now, two things here. I think it's troubling if this winds up being a new standard. Now, this is a superior court decision. It's not appellate level. It's not binding. But I think what you're seeing is a judge affecting societal change, right? Um, you know, sort of imposing her will on the way she feels, you know, she's, she's basically telling you that condo boards, you're responsible. You've got a, you, you've got some duty level as it relates to safety in the common areas. And is this a societal change? Um, part of me thinks it is. Uh, I, I think we had this debate over the last three years during the pandemic. Um, and, and even as a society. You know, you know, should condo boards be requiring people to wear masks? Um, should, you know, should we be wiping down surfaces? Should we be closing pools, uh, rearranging the deck chairs in the pools, six foot um, uh, areas? Uh, it, it seems as though societally that a lot of institutions adopted all of that um, to protect safety of third persons. So should we really be surprised if we see a judge doing that in this context? Now, put that aside for the moment. Sometimes, sometimes bad facts make bad law. Uh, the facts in this case were not good. Uh, the court basically said, look, you had 14 closed circuit cameras. What are those cameras for? Aren't you, aren't you there to, to, to be watching them and see if there's an intruder sneaking in through the garage. You had a you had a concierge that did building rounds. Shouldn't he have noticed the the keys and the things strewn about on the on the floor that the police noticed? You got key fobs and garage transponders, all designed for security. 
Here, there were board meeting minutes that came about as part of discovery where the board and the property manager were discussing improving security to the building, uh, denoting those sort of weak access points. You had prior criminal access and acts committed in the garage and probably most damning, um, although I think it's a little bit, I'm not sure I agree with it. Uh, Dr. Fields had complained via email and it's prominent in the decision to the board that there was open stairwell access where anybody could get up to his, to his unit. Now, if, if Dr. Fields wanted uh, access to be one way. So in other words, that he could exit the stairwell um, going and to go down it in the event of a fire, but that nobody could go up. I, I, I don't, you know, I, I think the judge seized on that for some reason. I, I don't think that passes muster because I think the um, uh, the code requires them to be open both ways. I think there's a thought that people might sometimes need to get up to get down in a fire. Um, and also, you know, fire personnel uh, often need to use the stairs. But for whatever reason, um, Judge Roach uh, seized on that as an issue. So, Sean, what is the condo to do, um, you know, if we've got a situation where suddenly condos can be responsible for the safety and security of residents? from the acts of third persons. What's the condo gonna do, Sean? Well, I think the first thing is, you know, again, you, we've got to, you've got to have a conversation with your attorney and with your management company about what, what, the, what the community wants as a standard, right? And then from there, measure, measure what you can do. I think well, I, I will say that in that regard, I have seen condominium documents and, and it's becoming more and more frequent where the documents themselves say that the board um, and its agents are not a, a guarantor of individual, you know, they actually write something into the condominium documents um, to set the stage, yep. to let people know, because there is, I mean, do you find, Sean, that in a lot of your properties, there's a false expectation that, that the building is secure, that the management, that the board is responsible for safety? I I think yes we do we do see people that that have these opinions that's what happens with multifamily living the more people concentrated in one place the more opinions are going to pop up the the reality of it is 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 you know we're not a police force as I had said before and we're not tricking the responsibilities we deal with people and we deal with their homes um, but that we're generalists we we deal in you know a lot of different things and we help get get the board to an area where they can make a consensus decision hopefully. Um, one of the things with this, with the, with the possible precedent of the attorney, or sorry, the, the judge's order on this, is we're in a, almost 50 years of condominiums, and still a lot of people in lawmakers do not even understand the basics of how condominiums work. So we're not landlords, and you're not landlords. Thank you. You know, and so we need to do and continue to be a better job as a community, as service providers, as well as homeowners that live in these type of populations. This is the largest segment that's growing in the United States for home ownership. Your voice matters. And there's stuff out there with CAI and IROM and their legislative communities, uh, emails that we get all the time that get sent out to homeowners saying, here's a new, here's yet another bill that's coming up from lawmakers that's going to cause an undue burden on you, but it's not going to affect the single family home next to you, which literally has the same exact problem. So I've been saying for years, Sean, that we need to invite judges to our forums uh, to let them understand what our community is, what it does, um, understand some of the, the legal distinctions. Uh, you know, it, it is frustrating yeah. when you see a decision in 2022 that says we're like landlords. Yeah, it's it's definitely important. And I and I I think it's a great thing to continue to throw out there, especially with people that do have, because remember, we've got we've got people that live in our, our residence that are actually in public service as elected officials. So, you know, it, it's it's interesting to to throw that out there uh and not say, hey, you know, it's a good idea to have the have, you know. A, a, a judge join us at a CAI event. I think that'd be phenomenal, um, you know, or some other event on there. Um, and that's outside the block thinking, but it's also common sense. It, it's you're you're putting out legislation 
or a, a legal thing without really fully understanding the parameters of what's happening sometimes. And you don't want to say that in, in such a way where it sounds disrespectful. They're trying to make a judgment for their interpretation of the law. But there's also the reality of how these places work. And we are not landlords. That I think that has to continue to be thrown out there. You know, if there's a dispute between two single family homeowners next door to one another, who are they supposed to go to? They either have to go to the city to get it resolved or they got to go to the police. Why, why does management and the board have to get in the middle of that? It's that's not that's not their responsibility. You know, you know, one of the things that occurred to me after I read this case and and it's something that I've uh, discussed with some lawyers across the country is, is it time for associations to go back? Uh, but it's always hard to go back to emphasize that, look, our responsibility is to fix the building, to care for the building, repair the building, replace the building. That's that's what we do. Uh, you know, we collect condo fees to do that. Everything's related, insurance, everything's related to that. But I think the reality is, um, and, and, you know, I may have some clients who say, that's what we want. We want to emphasize that going forward. We, we want to be clear. We want to amend our doc. This is what we do. We're not in the safety business, but but then you see a decision like that and you're like, geez, even if we do that, we still might be considered to be in the safety business because that's the way a judge views us. If that's the case, um, you know, should associations be looking to engage, you know, and I guess it depends on your uh, on the configuration of the association or the property, but did they start to look to engage security experts or security companies and then simply say, look, um, you're the experts and, and then shift any possible liability in the event there's an issue to the security company via the contract? What do you think of that, Sean? I, I think it is it's a it's a sound practice and and the people that that work in those fields are going to give you answers based upon their their expertise, right? That's what they do. That's how they pay their mortgage. That's what their background is. And so um, if it does help limit your exposure, and at the same time, you know the, the association and the and the community wants to to take on those tasks. Um, I think that's fine, but I think part of the conversation as well is is engaging the community and, and, and educating them prior to go ahead and, and doing this and spending association funds, uh, let, reminding people without without finger pointing um, and wagging saying we're not a security company. It's like folks, we all live together. We're all adults. Um, you know, here's here's a couple of best practices. Don't prop the door open. You know, if you see someone uh, that's not supposed to be here or it doesn't look right say something, call the police, you know, um, don't, don't feel like, like just now, because you live inside a condominium, you wouldn't do the same thing that you would do if you were out walking around the street or living inside a single family home. If I saw someone in my backyard, I didn't recognize. And it was after hours, they're not supposed to be there. I'm not gonna be like, huh, that's strange. And then call someone, you know, call the police. Um, that's, that's just engaging yourself as homeowners and, and more sets of eyes, the better. And, um, you know, from there, if, if that's the way they want to go, yes, then in, in employ and get with the security consultant and have them work with you, um, as well as your management team, as well as your attorney. And if you don't have a management team because you're, you're self-managed, make sure your attorney lease is involved with this to make sure that it's in line with whatever your, um, your you know, what you're trying to get to at the end of the day. And then don't forget about bringing in your insurance company to make sure that the coverages reflect whatever this new um, possible liability might be by taking on new things. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I mean, the, the sort of the dirty little secret or what you don't know when you look at the case is that the lawyers defending the property manager, the association, and the concierge company in this case are all insurance defense lawyers. Now, one of the things that I see constantly is condominium associations with million dollar general liability policies. Um, you know, um, my, my mentor um, and former law, uh, and, you know, Steve Marcus used to tell me, you know, a lot of people just are copying condo documents from the 80s. And in the 80s, a million dollars was a lot. Um, what I, I take a look at this case and I say, 
you know, you know, what is, what is one life worth? Like what is two lives worth? Um, doctors lives. I mean, you know, it, it is, do, do you see, do you think $10 million on a GL, whether it's in the GL or via an umbrella is crazy nowadays, Sean? No, I, I don't, you know, it, you know, 10 million is the new 1 million, unfortunately. Um, or somewhere along those lines, a million dollars doesn't go as far as Stephen used to say. Um, and, and so that's where it's also important to understand that, um, you know, if you, if you've not updated your limits or they're not in line with other buildings or, or other communities in line with, with yours, um, that could turn around and bite you. And, um, you know, as far as, as how much is a life worth? I mean, I don't think you can really put a, a um, a real number on it, but the court's going to exactly, unfortunately. And it's, it's definitely, it's, it's a tough thing to have to say to someone that this is how much that person's, you know, uh, life was worth, uh, when it does, that doesn't help the family at the end of the day, especially if you've done everything you could reasonably to prevent that from happening as a volunteer on a board or as a management company or, or anyone else. Um, and, and one thing, you know, really how I approach a lot of these things, which I didn't mention at the beginning of the, the, webinar is I live in a condo, but I'm the board president of my place, right? So I, I do this for work all day and I deal with this when I go home, right? So a lot of my decisions are on, on both sides of this table where I look at it as professional and also as a homeowner. So, um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of questions popping up on these, uh, you know, where people's opinions and these are fabulous things. We definitely should get to some of those shortly. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's the reality of of the nature of, of of the communities we live in, you know, where there is an extra layer of exposure um, by being in a, a building or a community with so many people in a in a dense population from different backgrounds that aren't immediate family members. Um, and because of that, and that potential of having more people coming to the property, your exposure goes up, and that's where it's really important to make sure your insurance uh, um, limits are in line. So, so what, one question asked here is, does each level of security protocol engaged, i.e. doing rounds, adding surveillance cameras, increase the possible liability of the condo manage, of the condo or the management company? And I think when you read Judge Roach's decision, the answer is that's the way the court looked at it. Um, and, and I think that's why we're trying to figure out you know, and, and it's hard to say, do you go back? I mean, for years, you know, we've had condos, we say, oh, no, don't put cameras in. Uh, because you put cameras in, then you're expected to look at them. And, and you're, you're, you're assuming, as Judge Roach noted, you're assuming like uh, responsibility uh, for reviewing those things. To me, you know, so, so I, I'm concerned that if the board just does nothing, they say, look, where we have no responsibility whatsoever, you know, a judge like Judge Roach could say, well, you're like a landlord, so you can't just do nothing. Um, but then, as someone asked, but if we do certain things and we don't follow them, then we are responsible. It, it seems to me like maybe the sort of the middle ground is, is relying on a security expert or a security company and saying, look, you guys handle this. We're not security. We're not trained to do this. The management company's not trained to do this. The concierge company's not trained to do this. But uh, let's switch gears. Sean, Sean's going to talk about what the judge found with respect to the management company and the concierge company, which I think, you know, kind of, um, you know, is troubling uh, with, with what their contract said and so forth. And it might give us some ideas as to how to, you know, come up with workarounds in the future. Sean, thank you. Go so, to the property manager. Yeah, uh, here we go. So, so the the court had held the property manager could be liable because the the manager contract provided that the manager would shall be authorized and required to perform all services necessary uh, for the management of the property, including but not limited to entering into contracts in the name of the trust and monitoring the proper performance under such contracts. And then you've got it highlighted on here, including for security services. Seems like a big, big reach. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, it, but maybe, maybe that's something that, you know, going forward, property managers need to be careful about what it says in their contracts. 
I agree. And I think, again, similar to other things, we don't have their contract in front of us. We don't know what preceded it or what what, what followed it. Um, and if there was any other language that was conflicting, and that's kind of why the judge landed on this. You know, one of the things that we remind people all the time is, you know, as the management company, we don't make the decisions for, for your community. The board directs us. We, we get information. We give them best practices. We give them advice. Um, but at the end of the day, we can't force you to do something at your property. So for me, on the management side of this, uh, it's important to note that, that um, you know, if, if the board is now saying they want more and more security, it's not uncommon, or I wouldn't think it out of line for the management company to make it clear on where their responsibility ends, including if there's already an existing contract in place. Because again, you can tell me to go out and get three bids for a security company and I do and you don't like them so you get three more and then you got three more but in the meantime I'm doing what I'm what I'm being asked to do which is to try and get you some information to move forward but in the meantime something tragic happens and now all of a sudden the management company is pulled into that lawsuit as well when maybe I felt the first vendor was more than adequate to do what you wanted but because I can't sign that contract for you and I can't force you to do so um you know, that's, that's a risk that the management companies have to have to weigh on there. And that's something for the boards to keep in mind as well as they continue to, um, you know, look at stuff and look at things and look at things is there, there might be a perception of um, it's taking too long to, to address it. And does that open up your, you know, your liability? Yeah, you know, Sean, I, I thought it was a reach here too, because the judge also focused on the fact that there were meeting minutes that that discussed the board's um, efforts to upgrade its security system, and that management participated in those discussions. Uh, I mean, it, it, and and I guess had knowledge of you know the prior intrusions in the group. I mean, it just seemed like to me a little bit of a stretch uh, as it related to the to the management company. But again, people. Um, as the lawyer, what what I'm going to tell you the reality is, is and, and you know I advocate for the law all the time, but you got to remember the judge is sitting there up on the bench, and she looks to her left, and she sees a lawyer, and probably behind that lawyer, the parents of two slain doctors, and then to the right, she sees three lawyers. Um, all of whom she knows are insurance lawyers for each of the entities. Um, and, you know, so does she fudge the law a little bit to say that, okay, I'm not going to dismiss your case. Um, and it is, you know, ultimately does it wind up uh, in a settlement posture, but it's, it's unnerving um, nonetheless. So, but if we look at the judge's decision, you know, I, I think there are things that the property manager can do. Sean, I mean, obviously, you know, contracts, right? Right. I mean, the, the contract's going to outline what the responsibilities are on both sides of the of the table. And, you know, again, a lot of the people in our industry that that have had long term success, either as managers or as a management company, is because we do service our clients the best of our ability. If we didn't, we wouldn't be around. So I always feel um, a little on the defense when we start talking about the contract. Well, my contract says this and my contract says that, because it's it's one of those things where you don't want to just pull it out on every single um, you know, conversation. It's this is supposed to be a partnership uh, between the the management company and the community for the betterment of the community to enhance their values and give everyone a nice home to go go home to. Um, but yeah, they definitely you know this might open up some some you know further contract negotiations and and more insurance limits and an extension with that. That means more costs, and with more costs, that means higher condo fees. And, you know, and you, you you hit on a question that was somebody asked. Mm -hmm. So, so somebody asked, you know, if my condo is not as safe and if there's violent crime occurring, whether it's in the garage or elsewhere or around my condo, doesn't that sort of decrease my property value? And, you know, the answer might be yes. Um, does the board have a responsibility to protect property values? I don't know. That's a tough one. But 
I, I think, I think, and we keep coming back to this. Does the board hire security experts and security companies to, to provide that extra layer of security to shift liability? Now, um, make the building safer, increase property values, but then obviously the downside is that costs money, right, Sean? It does. And don't forget, you know, you're in a condominium. You're not in a town by yourself, right? So if the area is bad in crime, that's a collective problem. That right. that that you guys need to work with your neighborhood and your elected officials and your police department. Um, you know, so it, some way or another, you know, it needs to be addressed. If it's if it's just within your building, yes, then that, I think that's a different conversation. But if property values are going to be sinking because your building and only your building is having a problem, um, I think that that's that's a different conversation. But really, you know, you're either going to be paying for it with higher condo fees because you have to get more security inside your building, or you're going to be paying for it with higher property taxes because you need to hire more police. You know, it, it is funny. I mean. You know, one of the biggest frictions I see uh, with condominiums is, um, you know, the, the condo fee. Um, and, and I, I if, if we're hearing from our residents that they want, you know, and, and to me, you know, owners should be looking to improve their value. Uh, and if that includes, you know, shifting liability, possibly eliminating liability and and getting a security, you know, review of their property by an expert or even a security company. Um, to me, you know, the money's well spent, um, but, yeah. you know, not every board, not every association, not every community feels that way. Now, Sean, what do you think about, uh, we talked about condos, you know, needing more insurance. Um, what about the property managers? Yeah, I mean, it, again, as as a judgment like this comes through, I'm sure property firms are, are taking a look at this because, again, if the assumption is going to be um, that moving forward, the associations, which are independent homes, not apartments, are going to be treated as landlords, then our partnership with that community uh, needs to be reassessed to make sure that our coverages are in line with the potential fallout of non-performance uh, uh, for something. And so, yes, I, I would expect them uh, to be out talking with their attorneys and their their um, insurance experts to make sure that they've got the proper coverages in place for you, the unforeseen situation like this. Sean, one of the things we talked about was, you know, evolving societal norms and how that affects, you know, a judicial decision. But are you experiencing uh, evolving societal norms that could possibly impact uh, access, control, safety, security, and condos? I mean, you know, we now have, you know, packages being delivered, um, uh, food being delivered, DoorDash, Grubhub, Amazon. Are you seeing that as, or have you seen that as a problem in any way, shape or form with respect to access control? It, it depends on the community. And so, uh, yes, again, yes and no. So during COVID, which helps kind of set some of these parameters for access control, so if, if you can put some type of positive on a horrible situation like that, this helps kind of get us ahead of this situation. Um, so, you know, if food's going to be delivered, um, you know, the community can limit that exposure coming into the, into the community by having them come down and meet them at the front desk, not just letting them go up to the floors unless that's what the community wants them to do. Um, and as far as package control and things like that, as long as the packages aren't being, you know, screwed about and creating trip hazards or they're being you know, someone drops one and it keeps the door prop for whatever reason. Um, I, I see that that kind of being limited, but I'm sure, you know, there's always going to be something that's going to present itself. But, you know, as far as packages, you know, Amazon's tried to use their, um, the, 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 uh, Cubbies, I can't forget, I forget the actual name of the thing right now, the, the lockers, right? And so, you know, that was one way of doing it. Um, there's a new one that they're doing right now where they're looking at creating, I think, their own access control systems to allow them to make, you know, um, deliveries better and easier for your community. Um, I think that that's one that really needs to be taken a look at because the convenience is wonderful for people to have them being delivered, but it's not the same as a fire department who has a, a Knox box on the side of the, of the wall so they can get access into the building without breaking your door. 
right? Those are two different situations. What about what about buildings? And someone asked this question in the Q and A, where there are multi uses, like um, you know, you might have uh, you know a restaurant or a bar uh, that has access through the lobby. You know, we've seen some condominiums with hotels, um, others that might have golf course uh, exposure or access. Uh, you know, where where it's you know, maybe harder to control access. Uh, what do you do in those scenarios? Uh, you know, are, are those are those properties more ripe for? Yeah, we we definitely need some sort of security presence or provider. I think yes. I, you know, you want to make sure whoever you're working with, say on the management side, has experience in those type of properties. A mixed use property, a, a public golf course property, um, you know, restaurants that are attached. I mean, you know, New York's got the the model, right? They've got the first floor for the restaurants, and then they've got the living space above it. Um, the bringing in a, a consultant, especially if it's if it's a pre existing community, something that wasn't just developed. Which hopefully, as the development's going on, they are bringing in, and I do see that with developers, they are bringing in security consultants and design experts to help limit that type of overexposure uh, to the residents that choose to live in live there. Um, so I don't think it's out of line. I mean, to me, it's 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 a fine tune of the reality of 2022 of making sure that. Um, you know, as, as the industry norms change, as we've talked about, um, and societal, societal wants are happening, um, if, if you're trying to stay competitive as a homeowner, but also want to have the security uh, of making those changes, you, you do want to talk with someone who I think is more trained than people that, that um, didn't go through a ten, extensive training like a police force uh, person or security personnel. They're trained for those type of things. They, they know where blind spots are. I can tell you where blind spots are, uh, but that's 20 plus years experience. Uh, but I still always learn something new every day. Um, and you know, one of the things that I gave an edit as an example when we talked about this was, you know, do you want your concierge chasing someone and running away from behind the desk because someone blew past them? That could have been the first person that created the distraction for three other people to come in right after them, right? Those are the type of things that you want to have those conversations with as, as homeowners. And, and I think that's the type of examples you'll get from a security expert is how do we limit those type of things from happening? So moving to the next to last slide, we're almost done, folks. And then maybe we'll try to go through some questions and then wrap up. We've been at it for a little over an hour. Uh, the concierge in this case. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the court, the court said, look, the, the concierge agreement, and again, we're back to agreements, uh, provided that its staff was going to view the monitors, make rounds, and, and, and we saw from deposition testimony that maybe one of the individuals making the rounds didn't, you know, it, it, it seems odd to me, and Sean and I were talking about it yesterday, how does he make the round on the 11th floor and not see the keys and the packages strewn about that the police find an hour later? And as Sean pointed out, well, rounds might necessarily not mean walking the entire floor. Maybe it's sticking your head out of the elevator. Although, you know, I, I wonder if that's what you really consider a round. Or maybe there's a jut out that you don't you don't see where where the actual um door access is or what maybe it's recessed a little bit but um but then in any event the court focused on that and then access control and then strangely i thought the court focused on the fact that the agreement alerted the concierge to the possibility that you may become aware of or notified of criminal activity just remember when in doubt report it now i, I don't know why the the court would seize upon that like i said you know I, I think the court was trying to hang its hat on certain things to keep the case alive uh for whatever reason um but i i guess what my recommendation would be is if i'm a concierge um you know i'm going to be very specific that what my responsibilities are going forward i'm, if I'm the concierge I'm not going to be doing rounds. You know, I, I'm going to be doing concierge things, getting your car, 
uh, getting you packages, um, answering your questions at the front desk. I certainly am not going to be doing rounds or taking certain access control actions. I'm not going to be viewing uh, um, closed circuit television monitors. But uh, I, again, I, I think, you know, and, and obviously if I'm the concierge, I want to take a look at my insurance as well. Um, but, you know, it, a lot of it seems to me, it keeps coming back to me is, is some of the contracts here seem to be a little sloppy. Uh, some of the roles uh, were not uh, neatly defined. Um, and, and, you know, they gave the judge an opportunity to seize on them uh, to keep this to keep this case, at least in part, alive, putting aside whether she's imposed an additional uh, norm now on condominiums that make us more akin to uh, having a, a security component in the common areas. So, yep. uh, I Sean. I was gonna say the blurring of the lines as we get to this thing, definitely, you know, having the, having the concierge, I mean- Wasn't that a song? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you know, having having clear clear expectations is really the key thing. It's a, it's a conversation. Yeah, I'm I'm not saying um, that concierge can't walk the floors, but if you've only got one person on 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 duty, you're you're leaving your front door unmanned or un, un, unsupervised. So that's the whole thing of making sure the expectations and the responsibilities are, are appropriate and that you've got the proper staffing in place as well. Because there are companies uh, in concierge, I work with all of them in, in the uh, East region, um, you know, because we, we work in, you know, all of North America for, for my company. Um, the, you know, I know all the concierge companies and they do have different levels of service. And there are times where they say, look, if you want this, we can't just have one person at the front desk. Or what's, you know, we need two people, one to, to patrol uh, and another one to, to meet and greet. So I, I think, you know, I, I've kind of come away with sort of five takeaways um, based on, on what happened in Georgia and, and, you know, more, you know, at least legally, what's happening, uh, you know, as a result of this decision. Um, I, I think the reality is the law could be evolving, uh, you know, with respect to a condominium property manager's responsibility in this part of the country to take on greater responsibility and risk when it relates to providing security and the safety of, of owners and employees in our condominium buildings, uh, even against the actions of third parties. Um, now, you know, I, I, I glean this from the judge's decision. Uh, the case is a superior court case, so it's, it's not binding. It's not precedential. It's subject to an appeal but when you start to see a decision like that, where she's citing law in, in some of the Western states, and sometimes you see kind of like fashion, like, I don't know if fashion moves from east to west or west to east, but sometimes law moves uh, from west to east. So, it, you know, to me, it's, it's something to be concerned about. And, and uh, I, I think the number one way we can protect ourselves um, is really through contract control uh, and insurance. And, you know, like, like we said, making sure our lines aren't blurred. And if we are going to provide some sort of security measures, have it done through an appropriate security company or expert, not through the con, you know, don't let people think the concierge is your security guy. Sean, what do you think about uh, the third takeaway? Uh, should consideration be given to the building? Um, make sure the building is secure, safer through technology. Is it expensive? Does it increase values? Um, I think it's, it's becoming the norm with regards to having some type of camera system out there. Um, and it's because it's becoming more than normal, the expensiveness is actually coming down. It's not as expensive as it used to be. So I think the, the cost control is better, but the technology is also a little bit more tricky. Um, and does it increase value? Um, 
yeah, I mean, if, if you're looking for a building or a community that does have, you know, security cameras around or, or, or you know, patrolled, you know, grounds, I would say that that does add a little bit um, more to your to your resale value if that's the typical thing in your area and you're on a street where every other community you know, has this type of thing and yours doesn't, well, yeah, that's, if you're doing a market analysis as a realtor, um, you know, you're going to say, well, you know, this building doesn't have security. Um, with regards to, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought, building secure, safe technology. Yeah. I, no, yeah. So, yeah. so I guess then we, you know, we could talk about sort of my fourth takeaway and then mm -hmm. I'm going to get to a couple of questions. Uh, should consideration be given to return to that strict diet of maintain, repair, replace? I, I, I think possibly. It depends on the association. But is it risky? Because see, takeaway number one. Takeaway number one is the law might be evolving. Um, so, so if you, you know, can you really can't ignore the law. So, Sean, that brings us to takeaway five. How do we protect our employees? Well, again, the cameras are there um, to, I think, help a little bit. And, you know, one of the things I kept stressing in, in my earlier conversations about this was, again, it's it's acting more as hopefully a deterrent, not a security system uh, where the expectation is going to be. I'm going to sit there and just look at that uh, and, and try and prevent crime from happening. A lot of people, if they see cameras, will will maybe think twice. That's, you know, that's that's the reality so that's the whole point of cameras is deterrent um as far as you know what can we do to maintain and, and protect our employees just as we talked about before um make sure that that their workspace is safe make sure that you know there's there's ease of access if they have to get away from a situation and that you know as a as a company uh, or even as a community if they're your in-house um you know staff uh have have some ongoing training. Bring in that security expert to talk about best practices. You know the active shooter conversations. Um, you know we do it in schools. You know we do it at workplaces. Uh, you know it's unfortunate. You know in this situation where we have to think about that as well um, in, in our homes. But that's that's something again that can help help you as an employer because you know, if they're your staff. Um, as a as a, a building, you want to make sure that your employees are safe, just as we want to make sure our associates are safe um, that work for us. Because we're also doing the same. We want to make sure that that you're as safe and secure as possible without acting as a police force. Um, as far as bulletproof glass, again, I, I think that one is going to be a, a case by case basis. If it's if it's something for that area, um, that might be something to consider. If it's something that's not in that area, still have that conversation, I guess. Um, and hey, Sean, you, you just raised an interesting thing that I, I don't think we've talked about. H have you had any associations uh, have a security expert come in, whether it was at a board level um, or even the entire association level, and have somebody come in and do sort of an active uh, shooter presentation? We, we have we have offered those services. We do have companies that we work with, uh, similar to other like disaster restoration companies that are happy to come out and do a site assessment um, and see if they can get people engaged. Um, so yeah, so we we have we I'm not sure off the top of my head, and I do apologize. Um, I, I don't know for at least my immediate sphere um, if if we've done one on site at one of our properties, but I do know that we have done them at other first service properties, um, and it is something that we throw out there every once in a while. Um, as part of our our um, conversations about you know continuing training with boards is oh are you aware that this is out there do you are you, are you aware that this is out here um, but I, I have seen um, trainings like that when when there's something that's that's fundamental like this to, to help engage the the community because it's all about community building the, the, that's the the big thing that's a big big belief for us is these aren't buildings you know these are these are your homes and you know if we can help get the community engaged or we've got a board that's really um engaged and wants to have more community events that's something you can kind of slide in there and help show um the community that you're you're mindful of of current trends you know we did this during covid we did a lot of of webinars and we spent sent out a lot of emails uh, ways for people to get engaged uh, with our, you know, using our lifestyle communities as as the template, um, so that people can continue to uh, engage with their homeowners uh, without being right next to them, 
And I think this is another another extension of that, which is, you know, how do we keep each other safe? You know, uh, one way to maybe foster that engagement, because I, I got a question on the Q&A, which was, you know, should our condo boards be trying to put forth an amendment to the documents that says, you know, we are not uh, a guarantor of safety and security. And, you know, I, I, I've seen, you know, it's, it's a little more than that. There's like, it's like a paragraph. I've seen the language relatively standard. Um, obviously to me, the best place to put something like that to set expectations is in the condominium documents, whether it's the master deed, the bylaws, the trust. And, you know, if you do that, uh, it's going to require, you know, whatever your amendment requires, whether it's 67, 75%. And quite frankly, in my experience, when you do something like that, it starts a conversation and people would be like, well, wait a minute, why, why are we, why are we saying we're not guaranteeing everybody's safety? And then, and then you have the conversation. Well, okay. Do we want to have a security expert? Do we want to have a security company? Do we, what do we want um, it might be a great way to sort of start the conversation or, as you said, engage in the community. I, I, we've done it with a lot of police forces. You know, the sheriff's department and the police department are really good about this, especially if they've got a community neighborhood um, presence. Um, always happy to attend those events. The same with the fire department. You know, when we've had the um, uh, those paddle uh, put in at buildings, you know, we've had trainings, you know, and, and we've had communities that have, have opened up with the Red Cross to do CPR training. Um, I think, you know, again, we're, we don't live in a vacuum or in these communities. We're part of that bigger community right outside the door. Take advantage of the community that's there. You know, it's all it's all about keeping each other safe and engaged. We live in that neighborhood. We don't just live in that building or we live in those grounds, not just that that block. Sean, here's an interesting one. Um, so one owner indicated that the fire department has a lockbox key on the condo property for emergency access after a recent response to a request from the fire department was to include the pass key to individual condos. Have you ever had a fire department request for pass keys to individual condos in the event of a possible future emergency? Seems a, little, just, seems a little odd to me. It does. It does. I, usually it's the fire department that's knocking down the door. They're not really worried about the key. Yeah. Why would they so, want the key? Usually they just break the door down. Right. Um, if there were, if there was probably came out of something where, um, you know, we, I've seen buildings where the fire department has come in um, and has asked the front desk, you know, is there, is there a key to this unit? There's a, there's an emergency, like there's a, a wellness check. Now, again, similar to this event with the with the concierge you know I'm, I'm not sure whether or not that's within their their scope to hand out your key to someone um that's again part of the contract but no i i don't think i've not heard that um example yet i did see that that was actually one of the ones i wanted to bring up as well because you know it's common common practice and public safety to have access to the building with an ox box but once they're inside the building and they go to gain access i have not yet seen um a fire department not stop what they're doing they'll always ask if they're with someone from staff like do you have a key to this unit no okay bang doors open um if you do have the key they're like here open up the door for us um so and, and I know someone asked that 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 they said the EMS is repeatedly stunned when they have an issue in the unit that they when they arrive that the site manager doesn't have everyone's keys and and I, and I actually usually recommend that management does not have everyone's keys because if something gets stolen or something happens in a unit and you've got the keys uh, you tend to be a a, a, a possible target or suspect. Um, yeah, again, it's access control and keys. I, I've, I have seen both sides of that argument and I, and I am on both sides of that argument at times. Um, you know, the, the quicker that management has access using, using say a master key system and it's a secure system, uh, you know, the quicker they can prevent damage if there's a water or something else that's happening and they can get in there and prevent, you know, 10 floors from flooding. Um, I, but it's gotta be used with caution and there's gotta be a lot of training involved and there's gotta be a lot of accountability involved. You better know where those keys are. Um, if, if um, you know, not, not you as a homeowner, yes and no, but as a management company, you better know, you know where those keys are. 
All right. Well, I think we've been at it for an hour and 25 minutes. Uh, I think we've answered most, if not all of the questions. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, the people for sitting here and listening to us. Uh, I, I think it's an evolving area. I, I'm going to continue to follow this case as well as, as, well as the Georgia case. Um, and, and we can provide updates. Uh, as I indicated, if anybody wants a copy of uh, the recording or of the PowerPoint, uh, simply feel free, uh, shoot me or um, Sean an email. Uh, my email is ed at amcondolaw.com and Sean is at sean.jordan at fsresidential.com and we'd be happy to get you the either the recording or the or the slideshow yep so thanks sean i appreciate that this was great i no, i, I it, you know it's funny too and it just it goes by it goes by like that it does. uh it's it's so quick um and you know, there are a lot of other detailed nuggets, um, especially in that case. Uh, and, and if anybody wants a copy of that case, let me know and I'll email you the case. Uh, I really think it's it's an interesting read. And I'd be curious to know if you read it, if your takeaway is the same as mine, that, you know, some of the the legal holds, if you will, uh, um, seized on, seized upon by the judge were a little tenuous or strained um, to get to where she got to. Mm -hmm. All right, so again, if anybody needs to uh, get a copy of the recording um, or the slides, simply, you, know, you can, and a few people have already plopped it into the Q&A. Uh, simply let us know. You've got our emails here. Um, and we thank you all uh, for attending. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'll, I'll um, just before you sign off too, I'm going to be up at the, um, the Burlington show this Saturday too. Oh yeah. So will I. So if anyone who's on these, uh, on these chats or whatever, want to come up, I'll be up there all day. Uh, it's a CAI event. Um, I think it's, it starts at nine in the morning. It goes until about, I think, two o'clock in the afternoon. It's up in Burlington, Massachusetts. Yeah. So that, so that is the, the, the CAI, is it, is it Mass, is it, it's the Massachusetts conference, right? Yeah. It's the Massachusetts show, but I, you know, we'll see people coming up from Rhode Island and Connecticut and, and from down from New Hampshire and yeah. Maine. Yeah. Um, and that's at the, is it, is it the Burlington Marriott? Correct. It's the, at the Marriott. Yep. Uh, yeah, we'll have a booth there as well. Excellent. Um, you know, hey, and maybe, maybe you know, if you got any questions, I'll go grab Sean, and uh, uh, or or I'll go to his booth, and and we would be happy to meet some of the folks that were on the webinar today. That'd be wonderful. Thanks, folks. Thanks, everyone. All right, I'm going to end it right now. Thanks, Sean. Thanks a lot, Ed. Um, I think the questions stay as part of the um, thing, too. So if we want to, um, we can always follow up with that. Maybe another like a, a email blast to kind of answer some of these or something. Yeah, I tried to answer some of them. Um, I tried to answer a few of them as we went. Cool. All right, well, I will see you on Saturday. Thank you again for this. All right, thanks, Sean.